Thank you. I always plug my ears during the bio. I think I can't bear to listen to what I've done. Um, so <laughs> this is, and you can, you can kind of, maybe if I hold it here, that's good. <laughs> yes. This is the first way you have to, to sing yourself, you have to have the mic at the right place. So this talk is indeed called How to Sing Yourself. And this is uh, one, of, one of Paul's first suggestions for the talk. And then he had some other ones. But I had become very attached to this one because I thought that it had several possible meanings. I thought that it could be like a book, a self-help book that you see advertised on the subway. I thought that it could be a more low-scale campaign launched by some local voice teacher. <laughs> and finally, I thought that it could be a sort of intangible tutorial on masturbation. <laughs> like how to touch yourself, how to sing yourself. Uh, and I thought that this was a good way to kind of foreground everything else um, because I think that a lot of my work that I've done is, um, is about pleasure in some way and, and possibly perversion, but definitely pleasure. And I like amusing myself, I like playing, I like doing things of that nature. And um, it only dawned on me recently that um, art is only masturbatory. Art is masturbatory not because the artist is experiencing pleasure, but because the audience is not. So it's okay to experience pleasure. <laughs> However, if you are in this landscape, of this, this paradisic landscape of pleasure, you have to have some pain to temper it, which leads me to my first step. Accentuate the negative. <laughs> you will find this to be very important. Uh, I always, every day I like to think about something bad that happened. <laughs> and I like to focus on it. So today, many bad things happened. The, the one that is most fresh in my mind is that on the way down here, I lost my iPhone. I mean, from a hotel room to here, I lost my iPhone charger. It may be, don't start looking for it now, but it may be somewhere <laughs> out there. Um, it's probably obsolete now. Like, I probably can't, it's a four, an iPhone 4 or something. You know, I probably have to go to the black market to purchase a new one. I don't know. But this is a horrible thing that occurred. To me, this is something happened to me, and it made me suffer. And although I am only staying on a different floor in this building, I was still almost late to this show. <laughs> so as I was coming down, I was, you know, all, all just in a tizzy because of this charger. Then I ran into some, you know, some pleasant friend who was trying to calm me down. This, this sort of, and I complained about the charger. I said, it's lost. I can't, you know, I'll have to, I'll have to bid some astronomical amount on eBay for all this thing. And this inevitably leads to a person saying, you know, if you think that this constitutes a bad day, I have to wonder if you've ever really had a bad day. And then they always ask me if I really have. At that point, I always have to think and then I always have to say. E c'è stato il trip di funghi del 2007. Ero a casa a provare per un'opera quando mi chiamarono due amici. Siamo andati a un parri a bussare. Sarà 
That's another reason that it's called the singers, because I also like to sing. Um, and, you know, my, yes, you know, I like to sing. I was going to say some more, like, uh, intellectual things, but I think we should just not. <laughs> this is how I started out. This is an early Orientalist period. Um, and... I decided to go public with this picture in the wake of the Rachel Dolezal thing. I, <laughs> I wanted to take some of the heat off of her. As a teenager, I, uh, those aren't, uh, there's a, I'm surly next to a station wagon with a glow-in-the-dark firefly shirt on. And I do not have dreadlocks, but I have my hair in very many tiny braids. Then I became a painter, and I started trying to put myself into these different images. I used myself as a model and started casting myself into different roles. Um, they were always green. Um, then I started using myself and other people, and these things, they weren't necessarily... Um, about me, but they used me, and also my mother. And there she is. There's a fish. <laughs> and gradually, I started to um, observe other people in my life. I always was interested, and I'll, and continue to be in these sort of outrageous characters, but outrageous characters who I love. I mean, I don't love them at all moments, but I love them fundamentally. And they're kind of outrageous and sort of uh, on the outskirts of self-awareness, but still self-aware. And so I started doing portraits of, the, of some of these people. I include myself in this category, too. So, um, and I, I also in consider myself another person. So <laughs> other people, including myself, I started writing about and um, transitioning more into language and using writing to um, make monologues and stories about these people. And one person I wanted to write about was my mother. And um, I struggled for a long time to find a way to write about her because there's a, you know, a lot going on with her. Um, just, I mean, she's a fascinating person. And, um, you know, and she's my mother. And I needed something to focus this stuff I was writing about her. And at some point, I realized I, well, at some point I realized, you know, she just has all these cats, and she just talks about them all the time. <laughs> at that moment, I had to recognize the shock of the obvious. Ambassador baby, bucket of cuddle, confetti, darling, Evie, fix a dent. These are good cat names. <laughs> Glitter, honeygram, iodine, jiffy, Kleenex, lint screen, McNugget. Good names for a cat. Noodles, Nefertiti, operetta. Officer Kitty. <laughs> These are good cat names. Psalm, proverb, quacker, 
Robot Rami Cub Seashell. Good names for a cat. <laughs> tobacco, Tabasco, Ukulele, Velvet Elvis, Wiggles, X Hubby, Ypsilanti, and Zebra Cake. Good names for a cat. I mean it. If you want some more good names, you gotta pay money. Send me a email. Cat names at Hotmail. Credit card number. Pay me six dollar. And I'll send ya more good names for a cat. That was a piece I made when I was 20 in response to an exercise in which we were, we were supposed to like read Robert Pinsky's ABC poem. <laughs> he used the alphabet and they were like, he's really talking about the human condition, but using the alphabet and you can too. And I thought, yes, I can. <laughs> and many still consider that to be my masterwork. <laughs> it was just broadcast across Australia. It's gonna be at a festival in Chicago in a couple weeks. Cat names. I never bothered to memorize it, but other people have. I am not a cat lady, my mother declares. A bag of whiskers under her arm and a Maine coon at her feet. She marches through the laundry room to answer the lament of a portly calico who is kept locked in the pantry. No, you stay out here, Don Diego, she cautions the Maine coon. Mrs. Scummidge has yet to reconcile herself to other cats. Thus she remains in self-imposed exile here in the pantry. My mother manages to slip into Gummidge's chamber without Don Diego. Well, Gummidge, you didn't finish your white albacore. Why didn't Gummidge finish her white albacore, pray tell? She directs the question to the calico while referring to her in the third person, the way in Batman, Alfred speaks to Bruce Wayne. Master Wayne wishes not to entertain any guests this evening. Gummidge desires that I take this tiresome tuna away and present her in its stead with some fresh whiskers or perhaps some science diet. Yes. Gummidge needs a new snacky. She moves from butler talk to baby talk. Gummidge finished with that toonie. She done. My mother emerges from the pantry, the china plate of abandoned albacore in one hand, the now slightly lighter package of whiskers in the other. She is wearing a calf-length pink cotton skirt and a discarded t-shirt of my brother's that bears down the front the word paranoia six times. Her hair hangs down to the middle of her back, though it's gradually becoming more and more white. For years, it was a deep copper, with just two silver streaks that framed her face. These streaks had been a lineament of her icon in my childhood. Several of my classmates had believed her to be a witch, citing the strange strands of silver, symbols of age that stood in contrast to her still youthful face. My mother has some wrinkles now, but her lips remain overly full, defiantly young. Only months ago, a Walmart one-hour photo clerk mistook her for my wife. <laughs> she is an age chameleon. Sit down, Carol, she says to my aunt, the sister of my father who waits for her in the kitchen. I'm just going to run upstairs and quickly change. Take your time, Carol calls. My mother is usually an obsessive hostess, assaulting guests with hot chocolate and pillows, items of sustenance and comfort. But Carol comes over almost every day now. She's slender with recently bleached blonde hair and red lipstick. She had once embarked on a Broadway career, but aborted it, opting to marry and raise a family. Still, she is revered by community theater goers throughout the greater Kalamazoo area. Her husband, Jerry, recently had an affair with an amateur country western singer named Debbie. He's now divorcing Carol. She has taken to self-medication, frequently preparing cocktails of vodka and various anti-anxiety pills. 
My mother returns in a purple skirt with intricate black designs, a luminous gold short-sleeved shirt, and alligator boots. Want to visit Gamich? she asks. Oh, not right now, Kit, Carol replies. In a bit, though, I'll see plenty of her. Carol has agreed to help my mother take Mrs. Gummidge to the vets this afternoon. She's awfully forlorn, you know. A one-time filmmaker, poet, mixed-media artist, and high school English teacher, my mother has not created work since our house burned down in 1986, destroying her reels, assemblages, and manuscripts. Since that time, she has, however, devoted herself to the 24-hour-a-day interactive performance installation of Caring For, integrating herself into taking over and dramatizing the lives of cats. While critics, historians, neighbors, and the mailman all classify this piece as quintessential theater of the cat lady, my mother often entitles it, I am not a cat lady. This could be understood as a surrealist strategy, akin to that which Magritte employs in his famous painting of the pipe, accompanied by a caption that reads, this is not a pipe, or perhaps I am not a cat lady is in line with the philosopho religious texts of Simone Weil, who asserted that contradiction is the test of reality. My mother, the cat lady who is not, wishes to keep her relationship to the cats unexplained, to create a void, a momentary evacuation of meaning where something unpredictable might happen. A vacancy could be created and God might show up to fill it. Who knows? Similarly, my mother summons the void in her baby talk to cats. A militant grammarian, she is prone to suddenly deny her understanding of subject-object, past-present, affect a speech impediment, and recite Elmer Fuddian incantations. I remember once doing my middle school algebra assignment at the kitchen table. In the company of my mother and our cat, Cubby, a former stray with one ear who bore a remarkable resemblance to a baby bear cub and had taught himself to sit up and beg and wave for treats, play fetch, and a variety of other circus bear tricks. As Cubby blankly watched my pencil in the erratic movement of equation solving, my mother announced in baby talk, Cubs don't do arithmetic. <laughs> no, hum don't do no arithmetic. She pushed her lips out in a half pout, half kiss, tensing her mouth. She spoke in spite of the tension. Him don't do no arithmetic. Him don't know him don't do no arithmetic. She repeated insistently. She chanted the phrase over and over again, distorting the words more and more each time, pursing her lips more intensely. She spoke as if she simultaneously wanted to be Cubby, to make out with him, and to eat him. Just gobble him up. She would have cuddled with him if she could have been sure she wouldn't have let herself go in a Lenny-like moment of over-exuberance. Instead, she cuddled morbidly with language itself. As Warhol dissolved the aura of celebrity through his serial representation of famous faces, as the Marquis de Sade used his character's repetition of criminal and perverse acts to purge those acts of their meaning, so my mother, through repetition, flushed all the logic out of the fact a cat can't do math. Shock of the obvious. <laughs> now, as I continue to, could have, it could be brighter on here too, I think maybe. Yeah, brighter. Um, as I continued to create these sorts of portraits of people, people, <laughs> uh, I increasingly became aware that I was drawn to um, describing people who I know who weren't really in places that they wanted to be. All these outrageous characters who kind of use daily life as a venue for performance. People who wanted to really be center stage but were muddling through on the margins. And gradually, I came to register that I myself was often in places that I did not want to be, namely, day jobs. <laughs> and so, 
and I, although this is often not a good idea, I was compelled to do it. I wanted to um, vengefully kind of reclaim the time I spent in these places. So I worked, for instance, for an opera pirate. It's a man who sells pirated opera recordings. And it was a very, there was a, a strange dissonance there because I was just m very mechanistically reproducing these CDs and DVDs, but we were listening to all this sumptuous, tragic opera at the same time. So it was a kind of pleasurable experience and an alienating one. So I made an Italian aria about that. And um, I hawked audio guides at the Guggenheim for $8 an hour, and so I made a sort of audio tour of that experience. I worked for a blind gallerist for a time and wrote up a, you know, an artist statement on that. And um, I worked for a music publishing company. And let's say I still do work at this music publishing company. Let's say I work at Bumble and Maw a classical music publishing company whose main office is in London. I am positioned in the rental library, which is at the bottom of the cast system. I refer to the staff in our department as the rentally ill. <laughs> Patty is our boss. She's an opera singer. There's a hole under Patty's desk, not just a hole in the flat green carpet, but a hole in the floor itself. There's a pipe in the hole, and it intermittently spews steam that rises up above Patty's desk through the dying leaves of a weeping fig. Now, Patty's constantly announcing that she's putting out fires, which generally means dealing with the demands of cranky customers. It's a phrase drawn from standard office lexicon. But the steam above her desk looks like smoke and illustrates Patty's fire in a way metaphorizing it as one which will never be put out. Now, Patty's a little more centered than usual today because she's brought in one of her birds. Last week, she brought in Darwin, an African gray who knows several barnyard animal sounds and occasionally sings Queen of the Night. When Patty went upstairs and left him behind, for two hours he went, Occasionally moving into <laughs> Today, she has brought in Cully, a 40-year-old parrot who was recently made an orphan when her owner, an elderly woman on the Upper East Side, passed away. Patty sets Cully's little cage atop a file cabinet and says, all right, everyone, I'm going for a meeting at the Met Opera Library. I should be back around 4 o'clock. We all nod or grunt slightly. I should be singing at the goddamn Met, Patty mutters as she exits. For the next two hours, I sit next to the phone and do not answer it. I have learned that there's invariably a clueless and panicked orchestra librarian on the other end trying to place a last minute order. And each of the 6,000 customers acts as if he or she is the only one. Beep. Oh, hi, this is Lisa from You Know Where. I'm trying to rent Ravel Bolero again, hoping you have the parts airmailed to the gear by morning, also hoping you can waive the $250 rush fee. Our orchestra's really struggling here. I'm sure you understand. Give me a call back as soon as humanly possible. You have the number. Beep. Hello. This is William Moore. That's Moore. M. O. O. I. as in Marianne Moore, the poet. If you don't know who that is, well, I should advise that you learn. 
pressing on. I do not want to rent any music, and I'm in need of some information which I'm hoping you can provide. It concerns the Ravel Piano Concerto in G and a certain eighth note, which has been marked as sharp and which I believe should have been marked as a flat. Hoping to compare notes with you, no pun intended. <laughs> and see if we can't get to the bottom of this. Beep! Hey, baby, it's Nancy Fish, San Diego Symphony. Listen, baby, I got a conductor breathing down my neck here. I'm going to need those advanced string parts for Benjamin Britten, 4C interludes pronto, like yesterday morning. And I swear, if you charge me a $250 rush fee, I'll break your goddamn neck. I'll stick a gun in your mouth. I would never do that. <laughs> I love you, baby. Call me. Beep. They are a culture of emergency. In response, I have transformed the phone lines at Bumble and Maw into a theater of deprivation. <laughs> Before customers are transferred to the voicemail system. They are placed on hold for several minutes as minimalist music plays. <laughs> if a customer insists that I must call her back by the end of the day, I'll call her back the following one. If a customer leaves two desperate messages in a row, his name is moved to the bottom of the callback list. If he leaves a third, a thick and indelible black mark is drawn across his name and number. Some days I cross off so many names with that sharpie I get high off the fumes. I'm so enveloped in the world of the office that I can't imagine myself outside of it. I don't know who I would be if I weren't here between 9 and 5 every weekday. I imagine I might have a breakdown if I found myself in my Brooklyn apartment on a Tuesday at 11 a.m. This is the dragon at the edge of a flat world. And I cling to the perks of the job, which are, I imagine, the whiteout and paper clips I steal. For a year I've been telling friends I've been time I say it, my eyes get a little dark. I'm like Pirate Jenny, scrubbing the floors, waiting for her shit to come. That's right. No more five days to wait for this one. I'm gonna get me a catering gig. Make more time for me work. Me up. They'll see. Oh, they'll all see. One eye is kept on that psychic ocean, waiting for the first glimpse of that skull on that mast coming up on the misty horizon. The other eye is kept on Google. I Google myself compulsively, <laughs> hoping to find that I've been up to something, <laughs> hoping to discover some bit of encomium to me on a blog somewhere. Today, though, I Google brain aneurysm. I find a message board of survivors who share experiences of the slow recovery process after surgery and little instances of memory loss. One woman jovially recounts having temporarily forgotten who her husband is. Was. Another responds with an anecdote about one day absent-mindedly going to the grocery store over and over again, only to wake up the next morning and find that she had five cartons of milk. I begin to think about my grandmother, who sat in a chair for 15 years and did not speak or make eye contact. Her mind began to deteriorate when I was a child. One day my mother had had a talk with me. Joseph, if anything like what has happened to your grandmother ever happens to me, I have an instruction for you. Are you listening? Yes, I had said in my ten-year-old voice. <laughs> if 
anything like that ever happens to me, if I'm in a nursing home somewhere, I want you to bring me chocolate. <laughs> they may not allow it, but I want you to smuggle it in. Hershey Kisses. It's important that I tell you this now, because when that time comes, I simply may not have the facilities to communicate it to you. But believe me, I will want it. <laughs> I'm startled out of my recollections by the sounds of a rattling cage. I look over and see Cully, the orphan bird. <laughs> Who's a dirty pooper? She asks. We all break out laughing. You're a very dirty bird. <laughs> she speaks in a New York accent with a smoker's voice. <laughs> it dawns on me that this is the revenant voice of her deceased owner. <laughs> Who's mommy's little pooper? She asks. A dropping hitting the floor of the cage. Thank you. So those are some old, some old hits. Um, and that leads me into my next step, which is introduce a stranger. I liked it because it sounded mysterious. Who could the stranger be? I don't know. Oh no, not that. No, no, please. Please, not that. <laughs> please, no, please. Help, now. Um, so, part of <laughs> part of recognize the shock of the obvious I recently interviewed the painter Marilyn Minter, and she said uh, some teachers encourage their students to really stretch themselves and do, you know, do things that they don't know how to do. And she said, I encourage my students to do what they are really good at because there are enough struggles involved in embracing your gifts. So that's part of like embrace the shock of the obvious. The obvious is actually quite elusive, but then once you have located it, you should embrace it. But then, after that, after you become well acquainted with the obvious, then it is good to introduce a stranger. Meaning, introduce an element that is unfamiliar or uncomfortable, and this may be a failure and may put into focus who you, who you really are, or it may um, create some other special dimension. So that stranger could be a death-like figure who picks you up in a black taxi and takes you to Yonkers. For instance, <laughs> maybe to, um, you know, Newark. And this stranger may not speak to you. This stranger may take you on a bridge that goes underwater. You may drive around underwater. You may come back up. Stranger may ask, act as if nothing peculiar has gone on. And you may be left to gaze longingly out the window and say this.
Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings my lesson to a close, aside from the final step, which is... <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>